give you salvation just to possess it. You and I are to become the Christians God saved us to become. I want you to take the Word of God, please, and turn with me to the Psalms in Psalm 86, and we'll begin reading in just a moment in Psalm 86 with verse 1. The title of this psalm is given to us as a prayer of David, and that's what we believe it to be. And many people who comment on this psalm and have commented through the centuries on this particular psalm understand it to be the prayer of David. Parts of it are found in 20 other psalms, and uh, they either gathered what they penned from this psalm, or either, as some may think, this psalm is a collection of things found in those psalms. But we understand it to be David's prayer. And in this prayer, we see so much of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's been suggested that this was the psalm that Christ would have prayed when he was on the earth. And there are things in this psalm you'll recognize readily as statements about our Lord and Statements that could well be given about our Lord and prayers that he would pray. Psalm 86 and verse 1. Bow down thine ear, O Lord, hear me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my soul, for I am holy. O thou my God, save thy servant that trusteth in thee. Be merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. Rejoice the soul of thy servant, for unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For thou, Lord, art good, and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy, unto all them that call upon thee. Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer, and attend to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble I will call upon thee, for thou wilt answer me. Among the gods there is none like unto thee. O Lord, neither are there any works like unto thy works. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. For thou art great and dost wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord, my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. O God, the proud are risen against me, And the assemblies of violent men have sought after my soul and have not set thee before them. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. O turn unto me and have mercy upon me. Give thy strength unto thy servant and save the son of thine handmaid. Show me a token for good, that they which hate me may see it and be ashamed. Because thou, Lord, hast opened me and comforted me. Those of you in the habit of marking things in your Bible, I'd like for you to underline an expression, please, in the 17th verse. The expression is a token for good, a token for good. The psalmist prays and asks for a token for good. Some evidence of God hearing and answering prayer. Some way that's visible, if you would. For some, and perhaps not visible, but some inward blessing, peace of heart and mind, grace to trust thee no matter what's going on. Lord, hear and answer this prayer with a token for good. I want you to hold your place here just a moment and turn with me 
back to the account of David when he's in the fight with Goliath, the giant, in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And David was warned not to do this. He was told by the king in sort of a mockery fashion, Thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. But David knew that there was a cause. The cause was to honor the name of the Lord. And so he walked down into the valley of Eli and did combat with Goliath the giant. Remembering that all the soldiers in the army of Israel were afraid to go and face him. And when David faced off with the giant, the giant made a speech to David in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And he said to David in verse 45... David says to him, The Philistine, thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. The giant had said to David, that, uh, Am I a dog? That thou comest to me with staves? And he cursed David by his gods. He went on to say, other things of what he was going to do to David. Come to me and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. But David said, it's not about all of that. It's about doing what ought to be done in the name of the Lord. To honor the Lord. And he says in verse 46, This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day, unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And when we see the battle is over between these two, David and Goliath, we find David standing over the body of Goliath as his stone has reached its destination, and the forehead of the giant is fallen to the ground, and David removes the giant's huge sword from its sheath, stands over the body of the giant, and with one crushing blow, separates the head of the giant from his body. And then he holds that big head of Goliath up and shakes it in the face of the Philistine army gathered on the hillside watching all this take place. I could imagine that when he had that head of that giant in his hand, he was declaring that this is a token for good God has given to prove that he's all he says he is. David was a man who was well familiar with these tokens for good. Remember on another occasion, if you remember, when Saul was hunting David like an animal, that David was behind an area like a, a rock place, and the army of Saul had been sent around both sides. They were pinching in on David, about to overtake him. Just as David was about to lose his life, a runner came and said to the king, You've got to get back. The Philistines are on the move. And immediately he called for his troops to come and follow him back to do battle with the Philistines. And David was miraculously delivered. David lived a life well aware of the tokens for good that God could give. And when we get back to his prayer in Psalm 86, I want you to look at it, please. And there's some, some things I want you to write down. Because these things relate to all our lives. Every one of us finds ourselves in this prayer. And notice the first thing we see is the goal of David's prayer. What is he aiming for here? And at first you might think, and I might think, that David's needing help because of the situation he's in and the difficulty of it. But notice carefully as we read these verses. David prays, Bow down thine ear, O Lord, hear me, for I am poor and needy. And in this expression, David is declaring he has nowhere else to go, no one else to turn to. Preserve my soul, for I am holy. Now that statement sounds rather strange to me, because the only person who's ever walked this earth who could declare that he is holy is the Lord Jesus. And I can imagine when Christ was praying this prayer during his earthly ministry, he would pray this way. In the eyes of God, God has declared us to be holy. As a matter of fact, he commands us to be holy. If you'd like to make note of the verse in the book of Leviticus, in the 11th chapter, in verse 44, the Bible says in Leviticus 11:44, For I am the Lord your God, ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. God says we're to be holy. You hear very little today, I hear very little today, about the holiness God demands of his people. 
We give a list of things sometimes and say we're to do this, that, or the other. But God says, my desire for you is to live a holy life. That's impossible without God working in our lives as we seek after this. To live a life that pleases Him is what He's given us to do. And He prays this way. O thou my God, save thy servant that trusteth in thee. And again and again, we're caused to turn to the Lord and put our confidence in Him. Be merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. And the emphasis here is that it's deeper than just words he's expressing. It's the soul cry of this man to say, I cannot do what I must do. I cannot live. I cannot function. I cannot be victorious. I cannot make it without God. That's how deep this thing has been driven into his heart. I cry unto thee daily. He cries out. Sometimes even those words we cry out are inexpressible terms. I mean by that groaning from our souls to God about how much we need him. Rejoice the soul of thy servant, for unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. I want you to note the things in this verse he talks about. He says, God is good. I wanted to hear these young people sing this song. God is good. He's always good. The Bible declares to us that the goodness of God leadeth us to repentance. One of the devil's main thrusts and the world and the flesh is to try to convince us that God is not good. But God is always good. He can't be anything else but good. When we misinterpret something happening in our lives, it is for our good and for His glory. It's working for our good. The apostle wrote in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, For we know that all things work together for good, to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. So he declares God is good. We need to just declare that all the time. God is good. He's not only good, but he says God is ready to forgive. We need forgiveness and cleansing. All of us need that on a daily basis. We must keep short accounts. And in prayer, we keep those short accounts with God. Meaning, when something's happened in our lives, get it out if it's against God and against God's will for our lives. He is ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy. In other words, He's never going to run out of mercy. And the Word of God declares that His mercy is anew every morning. Every day we awake. We awake to the mercies of God. It even says His mercies are tender mercies. Think of that. Uh, No mother ever caressed a child. Uh, No parent ever comforted a child. Uh, No loved one ever gave comfort to a child and showed that comfort to a child to to ever touch even the nearness of the mercy of God and how God wants to comfort and help and strengthen us. His mercies are plenteous. They'll never run out. Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer and attend to the voice of my supplication. In the day of my trouble I will call upon thee, for thou wilt answer me. We, We need to believe by faith that God does hear and answer prayer. Among the gods there is none like unto thee. O God, neither are there any works like unto thy works. Now, other people may worship other gods, but there's only one true and living God. Would you look at it with me, please? In Isaiah chapter 45, if you'll have your Bible open there. In Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 18, the Bible says, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, He established it. He created it, not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. And notice the last expression in verse 18 of Isaiah 45. I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no other true God. I am the Lord and there is none else. Again in Isaiah 45 verse 21 he says, Tell me, or tell ye and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together, Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me. A just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. If you want the help of God, there is only one true God to go to for that help. He is a God who created heaven and earth. Who made you. Who loves you with an everlasting love. 
And that's what he rehearses here in his prayer. There is none like unto thee, O Lord, neither are there any works like unto thy works. He declares what we find to be true in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. He says all nations and all nations will bow down before him someday. And then we come to the goal of this prayer. For thou art great and dost wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Teach me. Now you may say to someone, teach me. Anything from teach me to ride a bicycle or teach me how to craft something with my hands. Or teach me how to get through this difficulty. But what does he say to God? Teach me. Teach me thy way. You see, the Bible declares that our ways are not God's ways. What we naturally do and naturally think are not the things God would do and the way God thinks. He says to us that our ways are not His ways and our, our thoughts are not His thoughts. That means that every human being has to be taught God's way and God's thoughts. He's leading to something. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. And then here is the, the secret. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Unite my heart with thy heart. The Lord Jesus said in the model prayer he, he taught in Luke chapter 11, when you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We exalt the name of God. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What is the great work in prayer? To get an answer? That's what we think. The greatest work in prayer is not to get an answer. And I need answers to prayer. How many of you need answers to prayer? I really need answers to prayer. I need answers to prayer for our schools and the needs in our school. I need answers to prayer for our people who are sick. I need answers to prayer for families who are suffering, standing beside their loved ones with, with, with no answers about why this is happening and even to what they're going through physically. And we're praying with them that they'd get an answer to prayer. Yes, God wants to give answers to prayer. But what, what is the goal of prayer? For our hearts to be united with His heart. For our wills to be given to His will. The answer to prayer will come when we're praying in the will of God. I need to know what is the mind of God about this matter. And then I can pray believing. I can pray with boldness. I can pray in faith asking God because I know this is what God wants. And so he's praying here and he's asking God to bring his heart, the praying psalmist, to bring his heart in tune with God. Unite my heart to fear thy name. And, you know, we don't want to pray that way. I don't want to pray that way. I want to rush into the matter as quickly as possible. Throw out there what I need and expect God like some waiter in a, in a restaurant to bring it to me and be quick about it. And I don't mean to be rude or unkind or certainly not take a, a, the wrong tone toward God. But I'm saying that's the way we operate. And often we pray and pray and pray and pray and it seems no answer comes. But the first great goal in praying is, Lord, what is your will? What do you want for my son? What is it you want for my daughter? Not my mind about it, but your mind about it. What do you want for this church? What do you want for my life? What decision should I make here to honor you? What is, what is your will in this matter? And if we were to pray at everything, 
You know, we, we think all the major things must be prayed about, but we've decided what's major and what's minor. But every major thing started with some minor problem we didn't pray about. And so may God help us. The goal is to be united with the heart of God. Then notice the second thing in this prayer, and that is the glory of this prayer. Verse 12, I will praise thee, O Lord, my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forever. Let's think it through. If the prayer is answered, if what we want to happen happens, will it bring glory to God? Will it glorify the Lord? If it will not glorify the Lord, we shouldn't be foolish enough to ask God for it. It ought to bring glory to God. Do we look at our children that way? We want to be healthy and strong, perhaps athletic or academic. But do we look at our children this way? The reason God gave me this child is so that this child will bring glory to God. Do I look at the pastor this way? The reason God gave me the ministry that I have in pastoring this church is not to build some big church. That really has nothing to do with it. But will this ministry bring glory to God? You know, we have so many things that are church-centered and not God-centered. We have so much activity that's activity-centered and not God-centered. We even talk like that. We say, well, you know, I just want to do what's best for this church. Well, wait a minute. Don't you think if we do what glorifies God, it'll be best for the church? I'm going to do what's best for my family. Well, don't you think if we decide we want to bring glory to God with our families, it'll be the best thing for our families? You see, we jump way ahead of the thing. As a matter of fact, forgive me, please. As a matter of fact, we start acting like we're God. And in doing so, we don't really need God. Oh, and may God help us. There has to be dying to self to really get our prayers answered. Because we'll want the wrong glory. We'll want to glorify ourselves. We want to do something that brings attention to us. He said, I don't want anything that doesn't glorify thy name. And he elaborates on this. He elaborates. He says, to glorify thy name forevermore. For great is thy mercy toward me. And thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Now this psalmist, what was he talking about? From the lowest hell. If Jesus prayed this prayer, what was he talking about? Thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. As deep as you could go. As far down as it gets. The worst imaginable thing God has delivered me from. And you say, I'm going through it, pastor. I'm in the middle of it, pastor. Well, do you know, if you want to glorify God with your life, I want to tell you, if you'll pray in a way for God's glory, He can deliver you and will deliver you from the lowest hell. He'll do it. But why should God deliver us if we're not going to glorify Him? I've been in the ministry more than 40 years. Can you imagine how many times in a hospital room I've had people say to me, Pastor, pray for me to get well. Pastor, pray for me to get over this. Pastor, pray that God will get me through this. When I get out of here, I'm going to serve the Lord. And when they get healthy and strong, you can't find them. They have no regard for God or anything about the Lord. Can you imagine how many times I've had people in family trouble run to me and say, when they're having trouble in the home, Pastor, please pray, please pray for me. Please pray for me. I need my family back. I need help. I need help. And you sorry, low down, excuse for a Christian. Excuse me. Have given God no attention. Though he's tried and tried to work on your behalf. You think that's cruel? If you think this little one horse preaching that I do is rough, you and I 
have a real shock in store when we look into the flaming eyes of Jesus Christ someday. It's a serious matter. God knows our intent. He knows our future. He knows what we will or will not do. And David is declaring in this prayer, I want this answered for one reason, that it will bring glory to God. And I don't think you and I ought to think we're on any kind of praying ground if we want answers to prayer and we don't intend to glorify the one who answers them. There must be this goal, and there must be this glory. He goes on to say, O God, verse 14, the proud are risen against me, and the assemblies of violent men have sought after my soul, and have not set thee before them. He's declaring, I understand why people do what they do, because they don't give the Lord their right, the rightful place in their lives. If we don't give the Lord a rightful place in our lives, that's the reason for our bad behavior. That's at the heart of it. And often we think, well, you know, somebody ought to feel sorry for me because I'm having a hard time. Somebody ought to feel sorry for me because I've been through some things that other people don't have to go through. But it's tough when we read things like this and and we understand that the psalmist says here, the reason people are behaving in a way that's dishonoring to God is because they have not given God His rightful place, setting the Lord before them. And we can do all we try in the world to get people to behave and do the thing that God wants them to do. Let me tell you, they're not going to do it no matter how much loving persuasion is given until they give the Lord His rightful place. And I am not going to do what I ought to do with my life until I give God his rightful place. That's behind all of it. And we work with many a young person and many a young couple and many a wayward person. And when we've been wayward, we have to admit the reason for our waywardness is not some circumstantial thing. Those may be contributing influences, but the real reason is the Lord does not have his rightful place. And we plead with people. We try to convince people. We tell people what ought to be done. We even say to ourselves, I know this is what I ought to do. But it's not about those things. It's about him and whether or not he has his rightful place. How many of you precious people have talked to yourself, as we say, sometimes in a figurative sense, blue in the face, and it's done no good. It's done no good. Even though you've tried everything imaginable, you've spent money, you've gone to great lengths, you've given all the persuasion you know to give, you've brought people in to counsel and contact, but to no avail. No genuine change takes place, and it never will until God has his rightful place. Why should it all change when a person is going to go on living in a way that does not bring glory to God? And he announces this. These people who are enemies have not set thee before them. And notice how tender he turns in verse 15. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion... And I think the the message here is he's coming right off the the evilness of these people, but he's saying, but God still has compassion for those people. And gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. It reminds me of Jesus on the cross saying, Father, forgive them, them being the ones who nailed my hands and feet to this tree. Forgive them, them who crowned me with thorns. Forgive them who spat upon my face. Why? Because he is full of compassion and plenteous in mercy. You see, the love of God should be the one and only thing that's necessary to conquer our hearts. Thou art full of compassion. Oh, turn unto me, verse 16, 
It means turn your face to me. Lord, let me know you're looking at me. I remember an old story about a little child who lost his mother. They came back from the funeral, he and his dad. They finally went to bed to rest their weary bodies. The lights were out, the father and his little son were in the bed together. And the little boy started talking to his daddy. And his daddy back to him, I love you. He said, Daddy, are you near me? He said, yes. We're in the dark, I can't see you. Well, son, we're going to keep the light out so we can sleep well, or at least try. And the little boy said to his daddy, Well, then, would you just make sure that all through the night, your face is turned toward me? And I want to tell you, that's what David is praying. God, just turn your face toward me. I want to know that your your eyes are on me. Turn unto me and have mercy upon me. Give thy strength unto thy servant and save the son of thine handmaid. Mary declared herself to be the handmaid of the Lord. That's when the Holy Spirit began to deal with her about giving birth to the Savior. But here he says, I want thy strength. Notice please. He says, give thy strength unto thy servant. Often we pray, Lord, strengthen me, help me. Most of the time we have to get to the end of ourselves before we even pray that prayer. But think about the strength of God, the almighty God, the God who created the world, parted the sea, the God who can raise the dead. And he prays, give that strength, thy strength, to me. To me. Oh, we need the strength of the Lord. Save the son of thine handmaid. This is the glory of prayer. It's all for God's glory. But I want you to notice the third thing. And that brings us to this emphasis. This is the good of prayer. The good of David's prayer. Show me a token for good. Some evidence. Give me something, Lord. Show thyself in a special way. Show me a token for good. That they which hate me may see it and be ashamed. Because thou, Lord, has hoped, that word means helped. Thou hast helped me and comforted me. Now, we know when God gives inward strength. We know we're in the middle of things at times and we should be falling apart and we're not because God's helping us. Evelyn and I have commented to one another hundreds of times when we've gone to minister to people who are suffering greatly and we, we seem to be having a harder time with it than they do. And when we were early in, early in the ministry and much more ignorant than we are now, though we still need some improvement there, at least I do, We used to leave places like that and say, well, they must have not really cared about things. Evidently, she didn't love him. Evidently, they they didn't really think much of one another. And see, we were so wrong. Oh, maybe in times that might have been the case, but we were so wrong. God came to those hurting people and gave them a grace that we didn't have because they were going through it, and the Lord helped them and comforted them. How many of you know that God has come to you when at a time you, you, you maybe without the Lord you've just been going in every direction, falling apart, unraveling everywhere. But God gave you help and comfort you. You know that? Sure he did. And somebody looking on would say, well, I, I don't understand. I don't quite understand. Well, they weren't getting the same grace and comfort you were getting. They weren't getting the same help you were getting. You knew in here that God was with you. You knew in here that God was helping you. But then he prayed also, he said, give a token for good. These people are against me. This wrong has happened and people are apt to think something that's not right. Would you prove yourself some way? And some ways he proves that is what he gives you in that grace and comfort. You know in your heart that God is with you. And he's seeing you through it. Sometimes there are other obvious things God does. I've prayed 
At times when we were in very much difficulty here, and by the way, you never try to do what we do, launching out by faith, advancing with God without great need. And the millions and millions and millions of dollars it takes to operate a ministry like this. You know, and, and some people say, well, don't wait. We're not trying not to waste a dime. But we're extending this ministry God's given us around the world. We have more than 2,000 graduates now from our school who, who are on every continent and in every state of America. And they need help. We need to help them. We had to educate them, train them. You know, when you, when you feed thousands of people and all this kind of thing is going on and house them and take care of the facilities that house them and, and uh, meeting places like this that allow us to assemble together when we've got other meetings going on all over this campus and other auditoriums and you're in this one. That's not an easy thing. And when the need is great, there are times through all these years I've said to the Lord, Lord, I know you're going to see us through, but just give me a token. A token. A token for good. Let me know. Now, at times it's just the peace in my heart to rest that God is going to help us. The other day, we, we had, it takes about a quarter of a million dollars to keep everything going in that school in Texas. And uh, the other day, a man who's been tremendously helpful had a big part of his business collapse. And he said to me, you know, we just can't help you anymore. I know a friend of mine who operates a Christian college and, and the church leads it. And a man who contributed a million dollars a year to them just lost his business and said, I can't help you anymore. And the gentleman who said to us, and a kind, wonderful, helpful Christian whose whole heart is in it. He's not even a member of this church. He said, I can't help you. It may be a long time before I can, but when I can again, I will. The other day I got in the mail from him a, a sweet, kind letter telling me that he couldn't help. And then a little later, weeks later, I got another letter from him saying, I did find this $14,000 I can give you now. <laughs> You know what that was? That wasn't just another note from my dear friend. That was a token for good that God is going to care and take care of it. You know how that works, don't you? And you know, that's not for me, just for me. It's for all of us. God, God drops tokens for good to prove himself to us. Uh, perhaps you might say that we ought to be faithful enough and keep our eyes on Jesus closely enough that we don't need all of that. But I find here David praying, Lord, a token for good. A token for good. I want you to turn with me, if you would, please. What the Bible says about the Lord Jesus Christ, and I believe he would have prayed this prayer. In the Gospel according to Matthew, the 27th chapter, we know that he was despised and rejected, was he not? We know that he was crowned with thorns and crucified. We know that he was nailed upon a cross. He bore our sins, not his own. He had no sin. He became sin for us, he who knew no sin. We know that he was beaten and spat upon, hated and despised, lied against, and taken to a place of crucifixion to be put to death. The public opinion of him was he's a thief and a liar. And we hate him. Even those who profess some faith in God cried out, We have no king but Caesar. Crucify him. And all the while God was working. Because that's why Jesus came. To bleed and die for our sins. To become sin for us, he who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. But can you imagine that angry crowd sneering, sticking out their lips, crying out spiteful things at him, stripped of his garments, hanging there, shamefully put to death, suffered the humiliation, suffering the humiliation of the cross? What about a token for good? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 27, as he was dying for us, in verse 45, now from the sixth hour, that's noon, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. 
for three hours at the brightest time of day, there was total darkness. Something unusual was going on. This is no ordinary man. God was giving a token for good. Notice verse 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. That's a token for good. How do you explain that? This veil, we're told, so strong that horses could not be tied one side and the other and pull against each other and tear it apart. But it's torn down the middle from the top to the bottom. No hand seen touching it. But God did it. That's no ordinary man being crucified. A token for good. Notice, please, the closing part of verse 51 of Matthew 27. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Think of that. Rocks bursting open. The earth quaking. Token for good. And the graves were open. Imagine that. Graves are open. Many bodies of the saints which slept arose. Never saw anything like this before. That's no ordinary man. Now what do your enemies say? A token for good. He came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Tokens for good. When the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Tokens for good. I want to tell you, you and I are not alone in this journey. We're not here without God, without help, without the goodness of God, without the mercy of God, without the forgiveness of God. And when we pray as David prayed, if we seek the same goal, Lord, I want to be in your will. I want to be united with your heart. I want thy will to be done. When we pray, Lord, I want this for your glory. If it's not in your will for your glory, then I know it won't be answered. But if it will bring glory to you, I want this. And the good that comes from it, for us, I give him the glory. He raises up a school. He raises up a church. He raises up ministries. He opens doors in every high school and middle school in our county for us to have a Bible club. He lets us in every nursing home, more than 30 of them, to preach the gospel. We have more than 140 different Bible classes across our our county and city. Many of them where people said no one could ever get in. This building stands, this building stands where you know, you told me, you told me, you good men told me, those people said you'll never have our property. And this building stands on the property we were told we'd never have. Now you think of it. We're living, surrounded by tokens for good where God has proven answers to prayer. And by the way, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's got a whole lot more tokens he wants to drop and give us. We just need to trust him and believe him. And not just collectively for this ministry, but individually for our lives. He's a God who cares, who loves his enemies. Who loves with an everlasting love those who despise him. And that conquering love has taken hold of our lives. Oh, what a token for good. I do thank him and praise him and trust him. And I believe with all of my heart, he's not finished with me or with you. With all of this, he's not finished with it yet. Let's keep on praying and believing. Would you bow with me in prayer? As a pastor, I'm encouraging myself. I'm attempting to encourage you. I want you to sit quietly and allow the Lord to work in your heart. The devil likes to come and steal away all of this. He does. He does. 
May God help us. Oh, may God help us. There are people with us this day who do not know Jesus as their personal Savior. They don't know Him. If they died today, they'd die without Him. They'd go into a Christless eternity. The great thing they need is salvation. It can be found in no other except the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved than the name of Jesus. You come to Him. Believe Him. Trust Him. And of course, that many of His children here listening to the sound of my voice who are in deep trouble, who are poor and needy, and perhaps you've turned everywhere imaginable except truly turning to God. I want you to know He can deliver you from the lowest hell. There's some of you that have made every promise imaginable to God. Your life is going to be different if God would bring you through. And somehow you got through it, but your life isn't different. Listen, that's dangerous ground to be on, to make a vow to the Lord and not follow through with it. Oh, may God help us. May God help us. We must trust in Him. We must trust in Him. All that I have, all that I need, all that I want is Jesus. Should I at the gates of heaven appear to answer the challenge, what claim hast thou here? What hast thou to offer? Yes, what is thy plea? With blessed assurance, my answer would be, all that I have is Jesus. All that I claim is is Jesus. All that I want, all that I need, all that I plead is Jesus. Of all earthly treasures, nothing I brought. No great deeds of merit have I ever wrought. Though vile and unworthy as mortals could be, I have nothing to offer, but this is my plea. All that I have is Jesus. I want you, dear ones, who know you're poor and needy, in need of the Lord, in need of help, I want you to come to Him. You'll find the help in Him you need. Ask Him to help you to have your heart united with Him and pray Thy will be done. Make, make your prayer a prayer to glorify God. The reason I want this, Lord, is because I want glory to be brought to Your name. And show me a token for good. The good of this, I want to see you in this. Don't give up, dear one. Don't give up, my beloved people. Don't give up. As long as God lives, there's hope for us. And He lives forever. Trust Him and believe Him. I want you to stand quietly with me with heads bowed and eyes closed. And let's pray together. Some of you know you're in such need. You ought to leave your place now and just come. Someone will pray with you, help you, encourage you. Some of you know you're lost without God, without hope. You don't have any assurance if you died today, you'd go to heaven. None. You don't have that assurance. Will you leave your place, slip out? Speak to your loved one. Ask them if they'd like to come and pray. They're ready. Speak to them. Ask them if they'd like to come and pray. Come and have a seat here and pray. Let us help you. Let us talk to you about Jesus. Amen. Spend the time here. Spend the time here.